To our audience online, this is Anna, and we are here one more time, as always, at 1 p.m. Central European time on Wednesdays with the ID Talks. This um, spring, and today is the last one of the series of ID Talks for spring 2024, we are talking about interface dialogue for community and peace building. It's an important topic that we are tackling as Salto Inclusion and Diversity that is bringing you the ID Talks since 2020. Uh, we are focusing on the topic of interface dialogue in this coming years and uh, the ID Talks is a way of opening the conversation, much needed conversation about the interface dialogue. Uh, in this series, we are taking you on a journey through faith, belief, and how to build project to encompass different perspectives in your youth and community work. Today, in the last um, episode of this spring's ID Talk interface, we are going to talk about dialogue and identity. If you are ready for some introspection, we are going to discover in this session what is the link between identity and the role of religion and play uh, and faith uh, in it. How to do religious? Uh, how do the religious identities of an individual and the community interrelate? Knowing that the religion culture narratives are an important part of us and um, their those of our community and other communities. Is there a clash between these narratives or is this clash inevitable? We have an amazing speaker with us today, Nyan Shama Okemwa, and I really hope I have pronounced your name right. Perfect. <laughs> uh, from Belgium. Uh, she's a defender of human rights for more than 30 years um, with a focus on decolonialization and intersectionality in anti-racism activism and has two master's degrees in education and anthropology, currently pursuing a PhD in philosophy. I think you are a much better speaker to tell about yourself, Nya Shama, and I am very happy to pass you now the floor. Thank you so much, Anna. I am very, very honored to be in this uh, conversation. I think this conversation is really, really relevant uh, in today's world where all over the world we are seeing, you know, um, conflicts happening. I think there are more than 187 conflicts globally at the moment, and most of them we don't even hear about. So a uh, very, very relevant topic. Who am I? Well, my name is indeed Nyanchamo Okemwa, and uh, I come originally, I'm born in Kenya, and I've lived in Belgium for more than 30 years. I'm a mother of four children and I have got two grandchildren. Yeah. Um, the name, the identity, who are we? What makes you? It always starts, of course, with your name. How do we call you? How do we see you? How do we know you, you know? Um, so my name, I was born as Nyan Chama, but then the priest refused to accept that as a religious name. So my mother being a very you know, romantic uh, person who liked to read lots of books, decided to call me Marie Antoinette Stella Maris. Um, and when I got confirmed, I really, you know, we had to take a name of a hero and I took the name of my brother who's called Robert. So I called myself Roberta. So here it is, Marie Antoinette Stella Maris Roberta. But uh, Nyan Chama is still my name. Nyan Chama means the one with a calling, the one with a gift like divination, healing, uh, clairvoyance and so on. So it still remains my own name, but you're not, you're not stuck with your name in my culture the way you are, the way you engage with the world also gives you other names. We call it nicknaming here, but it's not really nicknaming for us because it forms who you are. So I was a very passionate person and I had a temper. So they call me the one of the thorns, Nyakinage. I was the one who could whine. Oh my God, I could ask my grandmother more than a hundred questions in a day. So the whiner, they call me Nyariana, the one who whines. And I um, 
when I got circumcised, I was very fascinated by my circumciser. She was blind and she had the most scary eyes. They looked like, like, you know, like those lava, lava lamps. So I was always staring at it and talking about her like forever. And her name was Nyakenage. Okay, let's return back to my names. My names are Marie Antoinette Salamari, Surbarta, Nyanchama, Nyariana, Nyakenage, Nyakebundu, Okemwa. And all of them present aspects of who I am, characters of who I am. That's what it is. We don't stop to think about our names and what a kind of... Uh, meanings are given into it we immediately think oh yeah this is the name of a saint no <clears throat> when i give uh when i give a workshop i often ask people what's your name what's the meaning of your name and they go like it just means it just means angel i mean it's just... and i say no but who gave you that name was it your grandmother why did they give you that name was it your mother was it your father what did they want to actually you know, what was driving them to give you that name? Our name is one of the biggest and most influential aspects of determining who are we and what are we. But it's just one of the many ways of determining who we are. So personally, I think that, uh, you know, we are not, you know, contrary to what people think, that our identity is created, you know, that we are owners of our ego and I know who I am and so on. It's actually not true. It's actually not true because you are the sum total of so many other things. You know, you are the sum total of what your parents have wished upon you, what your grandparents have wished upon you, what your dreams are, what your hopes are, how you hope to engage in the world. All these aspects formulate what your identity is. Yeah. But all these aspects are influenced by other aspects, including, of course, your religion. You know, of course, let's start with culture. Of course, your culture, how you're going to be enculturated by your parents. And your parents are not the only ones who enculturate you. You're also kind of educated by society. You know, what you learn in the youth groups and so on. So what we call socialization, you know. But you're also born in a biological context. You're a creature of nature. So your naturalization is also part of who you are and your identity. But is that all? No. No. How you engage with all these elements is what is actually going to formulate who your identity is. We don't, we are not like an empty bucket that's going to be filled in. It doesn't work that way, you know? Um, so in, uh, in, since I want to link identity with also with our, our religion, it's important to know that identity is more than just how we identify you. Identity is also your sense of belonging. It's also your experience in that identity. What we call your ex, your what do you call it? Your um, your lived reality. You know what is your lived reality in that identity, and then also your existential reality. You exist in a certain context, which is informed also by other elements. And this also co contributes to who, to who you are, to, oh my goodness, I've created a problem here. Uh, mm, okay. So that also contributes to who you are, you see. So um, when we think about religion, we have to remember that there are, there are again, different aspects of looking at it. So we have religions that are doctrinal. When I say doctrinal religion, I'm referring to religions like Christianity or Islam or Judaism that are actually anchored upon a certain book, a certain doctrine, a certain kind of code that has to be followed. These are the world religions. And many times when we talk about interfaith, it is these world religions that come together to actually dialogue. When I joined ENOP, that is the European Network of Religions and Beliefs, I reminded them that, listen, African spiritualities have got more followers than all the doctrinal religions put together, you know? So we need to actually expand our vision when you're talking about faith and we're talking about spiritualities and we're talking about religions. I even feel, I feel very humble to pretend to be the spokesperson for African religions and, Af sorry, African spiritualities because there are just so many, you know? But this expands the explanation that I would like to give. So personally, I think that when we stake to uh, certain 
let's say Eurocentric way of thinking, then our identity becomes, like I said, an ego thing. I own my identity. I own my personality. I determine who I am. There is a sense of kind of ownership of uh, ownership and autonomy of who you are. And I would like today to challenge you that actually it's more than that. You are actually not, not the, the author of your identity. You are not actually not the sole author. Of course, you are part of it, but not the sole author. It's also influenced by other aspects in the society. So like I said, you you are in relation with, for example, the, um, uh, for example, with your own personal self, critical reflection, who am I? But then also the society, the social, the economics, the political, the religious, all this are giving you different elements of understanding who you are. Your roots, where do I come from, is giving you a certain depth. But what is my grandmother thinking? What is What about my great-grandparents? What about my ancestors all the way in the past? Also, your future. What about what I want to be, what I hope to be, what I dream to be? How does that influence my identity right now? So it's a lot more than that, which means that even if you are religious, you do have certain elements of spirituality upon which you anchor yourself to determine your own identity. And this idea is what makes it very, very, very much, you know, possible for us to have a kind of resonance with people who are having an entirely different religion, an entirely different belief system, you know? The fact that we are anchored upon a certain spirituality, our humanism, you know, is beyond a book. The way we address it, the way we interpret our Bible or the way we interpret our Quran is very personal and it's anchored upon your spirituality. Your spirituality is informed by how you are naturalized, how you are socialized, how you are, you know, uh, encultured and so on. So. My name is Nyanchama, and and of course, for many years, I used my my Christian my Christian name, Marie Antoinette Stella Maris. But when I became a grandmother, something in me just told me, like, I don't want my granddaughter to un to to recognize me by this status. And I decided I want her to call me Magokoro, which is the terminology in my culture for referring to a grandmother. Magokoro is something I've used very many times to refer to my grandmother. But when I started using it, it's like, it's like I got a completely different skin all over me. Magokoro means outgoing ancestor. If you take the etymological interpretation of it. Mochokoro means incoming ancestor. So I felt without even understanding the power of the name, the power of the idea, that it gave me a completely different identity, just embracing the term Magokoro. So personally, and I'm trying to like summarize because my time is almost running out, I will read. Personally, I believe that we are who we are in relation to others, you know, others with whom we are constantly relating, others with whom uh, who, who who also are existing within our own habitat. A habitat is our society. A habitat comprises then of the economics, the politics, the religious, and all that. That's our habitat. So we are always in relation, whether we like it or not, whether we look at them and do nothing about it, they are constantly forming and reformulating who we are. So we are who we are in relation to those with whom we are relating uh, within the, the, the habitats that we inhabit ourselves. So in this view, we are constantly navigating our complex and multi-layered and challenging, sometimes disruptive relationships with our habitat, you know, whether it is our personal understanding of who we are, our social, our economic, our political, religious, and also with those with whom we are relating who are also kind of navigating the same same kind of, uh, what do you call it, messages or signals that they are receiving. So in this sense, we are always, you know, consciously or unconsciously, intentionally or unintentionally imagining 
constructing, creating our own personhood and belonging in tandem with the shifts of who we are in society and how we experience who we are in society. What in jargon they say, our existential reality and our lived experience. So we are constantly reimagining it, reconstructing it, recreating it. In a sense, our identity is like a bricolage. It's like, um, oh, what can I say? It's like a weave. And as we weave in who we are, and others are weaving in who we are, as we interweave into one another, we form the tapestry that is society. Passively or actively, we are constantly weaving and interweaving into one another in this tapestry. So the process is often done on an individual basis, but then largely it's in relation with other people uh, who are also engaging in, in, in this habitation, in this, you know, habituation, habituation is getting into the habit of living in their society. I give you a very clear example. Please indicate to me when I'm going over time. I think I'm looking up and I still have like a-, a Well, you have, you have all the time in the world. We are really going quite well. Yeah. We only have had maybe 20 minutes of the talk so far, even less. So you huh. do have another 20 at least. So please- Thanks. Don't thank worry you. about time. If there will I, be a moment to worry, I will signal that myself. Please do. Thank you. So I'll give you an example just to before I go on further to my own spirituality. Um, and that is, um, you know, when you look into a mirror, no, first of all, a simple question. And I think maybe you've encountered it elsewhere. How come your, uh, you know, the image of yourself in the mirror is not the same as the image of yourself in a photograph. You know, sometimes I'm like, but then it doesn't look like me. Obviously, it's a different kind of experience of that image of your identity and who you are. <clears throat> and a good example uh, to illustrate this is when you look into a mirror, we've been trained to think in dichotomies. I, uh, you know, I am the, I am the subject, my image is the object. And of course, I look at me, I see my reflection, end of the story, yeah? But then I put to you that actually it's not that simple because when I look into the mirror, I see my image reflected as what I think I am, who I hope to be, where I am coming from, where I am going, how my friends imagine I am, how um, how the school expects me to be, what society has decided I should be. And so for me, my mirror is like a prism with different shards, yeah, always. But you don't sit and talk about this. You don't, it's like, it's like all this is working in your head subliminally. How I interpret that prism is very kaleidoscopic. I go down into the depth, like, oh, my, my roots, uh, my, my, my ancestry, um, you know, my, where I'm standing, my nature, my inanimate and, you know, my, my natural environment, all these are kind of informing me from within, from below, from out of me, who I am. And also how I relate, how I relate to my own family, within my family, with the scouts, with my teacher uh, colleagues, with my work colleagues, with the politics, with the banker, with the priest. So if there's a certain wideness as I expand my, my energies that my identity is also being formed. So to summarize that, there is a prismal kind of reflection of who I am and a kaleidoscopic kind of interpretation of who I am, which creates a whole complexity of what my identity can be. But all this is happening at the same time. We are not who we are without what others think of who we are. We are not who we are without what we interpret ourselves in relation to what others think we are and how we relate to others. And in this sense, it's not always, uh, it, we cannot presume that there would be a clash if my way of thinking does not resonate with another way of thinking because we have, that clash in itself is only giving me a certain kind of aspect of who I am. I know it's sounding complicated, but it really does make sense to me. So, um, so the process is often the process of uh, self-identification, your personhood, your belonging can be 
on an individual basis, of course, but then it's largely in relation to others who are also equally engaged in doing the same kind of, you know, kind of calculation. But this calculation is like, wow, it's like very, very fast. So our real or our imagined membership and belonging to each other and to nature is full of paradoxes and ambiguities and contradictions. And we try to find certain stabilities in religion. We try to find certain stabilities in our belief, certain stabilities in ideology, certain stabilities and so on. I think when we are confronted with a crisis, like for example, the Corona crisis, these stabilities don't, no longer make sense. And we still have to go right back to the core of what is my spirituality? What is my drive? What is keeping me going? For me, my guiding principle is the Ubuntu philosophy. And the Ubuntu philosophy views humanity in terms of I am because we are. It resonates very well with what I've been saying about our textuality and about how we are actually constantly forming and reforming ourselves in relations to others. So this philosophy alludes to the fact that we are mutually co-constituted with one another and we are co-constituting others, you know? So you, you're not... Uh, you're not like in, in a shell. You're also contributing to somebody else's identity formation and creation. It alludes to the fact that our interrelational habitation in the world that we inhabit is also in turn actually inhabiting in us. We are centering it within ourselves. We are anchoring ourselves in this creation. So it's with this in mind that I feel that our society would truly benefit from this idea of humanity because it gives a certain uh, shift element from that dichotomy of, you know, black and white, you know, image and uh, image and imaged object and object. It allows us to have multiple perspectives on how we assess who we are. It allows us to have a different kind of ideology on how we determine um, how we determine our interpretation of the world. So I believe that uh, you know, in uh, by using this kind of philosophy, we can start to actually learn what is it about myself that I don't know. Learn and learn, relearn. What is it that I don't know? What are the voices of others that I've not recognized? What are the histories, the religions, the spiritualities? Maybe our ancestors, what is it that they did that actually I've not even bothered to inform myself? And how does it enrich who I am now? Let us unlearn certain misconceptions that have been drummed into us, that have been that we've been told to live by. And let us, you know, let us relearn another way of perceiving our society, a more spiritual society, a society that allows us to actually embrace the in-between space, not just take on the end continuums of the black and the white, understand that the gray areas, that's what gives meaning to the black and the white. We need to understand that it's not something that you can take in a huge chunk. Actually, you can break it down to a micro, to a meso, to a macro level. You, you start by understanding, critically reflecting upon yourself, you know, critically learning and learning, relearning who you are yourself, learning and learning and relearning what your immediate society is to you and what you are to them. What, what nature is to you and what you are to nature, even the inanimate. Because remember, the way you behave in your house will not be the same way you'll behave in a church. It will not be the same way you behave in a market. It will not be the same way that you will behave, you know, um, when you're in the toilet. You know what I mean? And this implies that even the inanimate is actually in relationship with you because you are giving it meaning and therefore it's also giving you meaning, you know? We get a completely different understanding of, of that. So this is the micro, who am I? What about my relationship to my neighbors, to my society? Can I also use that learn and learn, relearn with them? Are there things that I have actually misunderstood and how can I implement them? On the macro, what are the rules? Is the doctrine really representing who I am spiritually, emotionally, my belonging, my existence? Is it really representing me? It's also a way in which we can understand that actually the past, the present and the future are intertwined. 
they are constantly informing us about who we are. We are thinking about what could have been. We are thinking about what is right now and how it's informed by what could have been. We are thinking about what we aspire, what we dream of, which is informed by what was and what is and what could have been. So in a sense, we are constantly actually bringing in our past, our present and our future. And if we implement the idea of learn and learn and relearn and the whole kind of whole constituted idea of identity creation, that whole bricolage that is constantly subliminally playing in our minds, it makes us that much more richer. We can't get intimidated by that. Even if we don't agree, we are actually learning. You know, we don't have to agree. We learn. Uh, for example, again, the fact that we are not just a bundle of cells. Our cells are informed by how we are, you know, our cells, of course, are who we are. That's normal. Yes. But then a bundle of cells is not going to be given the kind of uh, education that uh, the kind of uh, training that is given by its parents. So our we have to take into account that our biology is boosted also by the enculturation that we receive within our family and our local communities, our religion, our, our spiritual healers, and also by society. Beyond this, we are going to be informed by politics, which has got nothing to do with our immediate space, is going to be informed by world economy, is going to be informed by floods that are happening in Congo or genocides that are happening in Gaza. It's going to be informed, you know, when we experienced Corona and we saw all those deaths, all that, oh my God, we all mourned. We were both, we were all impacted, whether we like it or not, we mourned, so we were traumatized. And because of this, it's, it's in every culture that we need to commemorate that loss of life. We need, we need to heal. We need to heal. So having said all that, I feel that we can take our cultural narratives. And if we take our cultural narratives, anchoring ourselves on that idea of I am, because we are, we can actually really learn to uh, sorry, learn and unlearn and relearn another way of going about things and a better way of understanding ourselves. It does not take anything away from you, it just makes you more conscious of the kind of enormous kind of drama that's going on in your head. We can understand the value. Uh, I mean, we can implement it in other contexts, like, for example, in uh, climate, where we know in our heart and soul that actually we need to seek a balance between the planet and the people and the nature, because somewhere there, they are all kind of having an impact on each other. And if we seek a balance, we are still implementing the same idea. I am because there is nature that has kept me here. I can only survive because there is there is a politics, there is an economy that has to be boosted. And I have the economy because there are people who are going to engage in this economy. So we need to strike a balance because when we are out of balance, then one of the elements is going to be completely out of cinch. So this again is just our own spirituality informing us. Being spiritual does not make you less religious. Being spiritual just makes you a fuller person and opens up a lot of other perspectives to understand yourself, to understand your world, and to understand, you know, your, fu your future generations to come. I hope this makes sense. Uh, the question that uh, Maria is asking in the, in the chat is, how do we unlearn? And why unlearning is important? Because you repeated several times that unlearning and relearning is as important as learning. And yes. in the context of interface dialogue, yes, why is it important to unlearn and how do we unlearn? Okay. Um, you know, um, many people do not realize 
that the mindset that set colonization in motion dates back to more than 2000 years prior to 2000 years we had a lot of a lot of natural kind of divinations and divinities and spiritualities they didn't have the title religion but they were really really spiritualities the world in uh, in general, kind of mobilized itself to um, a theocracy. A theocracy, that means that God is the one who has the autonomy over Russia. You know, I'm not, I'm going to simplify it. Yeah, uh, just now. So the thing is, yeah. in order for the decolonization is, is the whole principle that that mindset is actually, you know, dehumanizing the other for the benefit of, you know, the, the colonizer. And one of the first things that a rational man, that's what Descartes determined, that Russia is not the autonomy of God, Russia is also the autonomy of the Western man. Hey, beginning of patriarchy, beginning of feminism, I will not go into that, but yes. But here it is, a rational man is anchored upon their religion, but the religion, it was created was created by destroying all the other smaller religions, divinities, and so on. And there were myriad, very many. They really, at that time, they were very much linked with nature. They were very much anchored upon the feminine deity and so on and so forth. Many of them were just, you know, negated as heretics, negated as false religion, negated as, as witchcraft, negated as, you know, heretics. And there were even killings at that time. So that more and more it became like, this is only the main religions, the Christianity, the Muslim, the Jewish, the so on and so on. But it came at a huge price, a huge price of very many of those other spiritualities kind of being dampened, which is why we always, deep down in our heart, we still fall back to those spiritualities because those were the spiritualities that actually linked us with our world, that linked us with nature and with each other, where what I am saying now was actually alive and lived, you know? So when I say that you need to learn Learn what were the spiritualities that were destroyed at the time? What were the spiritualities of my great, 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 great grandparents prior to Christianity? You know, what are the, 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 the narratives then that are still having some residual impact or influence on who I am as an individual? You know, um, that is called, you know, learning what is not being told here is learning, bringing it all in, the voices that have been silenced, the religions that have been silenced, the spiritualities that have been silenced, bring it all here for yourself to understand yourself and learn, and learn what are the misconceptions, you know? Because when we think about, for example, Christianity, for a long time, only men could be priests and so on. But have you ever thought, have you ever thought of how come all these doctrinal religions, they all wear gowns? The roots were female. All these religions, they wear gowns. They wear long gowns. Think about it. Think about it, you know? So there is a centrality somehow, a recognition and acknowledgement, but it's not, it's not overtly articulated. So like when you start to ask yourself this question, when you're uh, unlearning, but you know, some of these things are misconceptions. The role of the woman was important. The role of... Uh, you know, women did have, Russia did have, you know, and Theo did not necessarily have to be a masculine entity. It could have been a gender. It could have been gender fluid. We don't know because there are many religions where Theo was actually a female deity. I know among the Maasai who are very, very patriarchal, their Theo is actually a female, you know, deity. So when you learn, when you unlearn, that's when you can then relearn and accept that balance with the right information that gives you meaning, things which you thought like, ah, oh, it must be my imagination. It must be my fantasy. It must be my dream. You know, we learn that actually what we've been told that dreams are not informing us. We learn that they are informing us because in other spiritualities, like among the Sufi, they actually tell us that our dreams are informing us. Our fantasies are informing us. The shadow that we see that, you know, that shiver that you get and say, oh, somebody walked across my grave. You know, we have certain things that we wonder, why did I say that? But it is actually giving meaning 
and it's giving you some stability and it's allowing you to actually embrace that constant kind of bricolage of self-creation, self idea self and also embrace the fact that you are very much interwoven, interwoven with past, present, future, interwoven with, you know, your, your neighbors, your children, you're interwoven with the earth and you're interwoven with the, uh, with what you call it, with the dreams. The dreams are just a projection of you. When you actually get out of that, you understand that we are living in a very myopic world. It will open up our world. So that's why it's important to actually allow yourself to learn and learn and relearn. Who am I? What am I? In the meantime, we have quite a discussion in the chat and I think it's good maybe to guide you through it and have a look at it together. But uh, Anastasia here uh, is saying uh, that as long as I breathe, I prosper. And Slabodan was asking if God is love, why interface dialogue? Although later he is, uh, and there is a discussion about how do we define spirituality and also even an answer to this question from another participant um, that spirituality is an individual's relationship to God. Spirituality is not the same as religion, being religious. I am a believer, but I am not religious. Religion is related to belonging to a group. How would you maybe address this in your own words? What is this link or difference between being religious and having faith or being spiritual uh, where in your opinion or in your personal journey you feel these are together and where yeah. do you think maybe they are not necessarily the same or necessarily going together um like i said religions are doctrinal you know religions are whether we like it or not they are man-made you know um they are doctrinal they are based on specific books uh, the Bible, the Quran, you know, they are based on specific rules that you have to adhere to, specific buildings, artifacts, that, uh, and so on. And that is okay. There is nothing wrong with religion, you know. But spirituality is beyond that. It asks your relationship to, to the river, to the air, to 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 you know, where do I come from? Where does God come from for him to have created me? You know, it asks you to just go beyond all that. What is my relationship? Am I always going to be just a puppet or do I have a say? It's in, in religion, that is, that is heresy. You cannot, how dare you question, you know, God, you know, people who are spiritual, it doesn't mean that they don't have a higher divination that for, for which that uh, they have a, um, a kind of uh, an awe, you know, it opens up a way mm -hmm. to also understand certain areas that we have kind of called the gray areas. You know, how come some dreams are like, um, you know, like a, a spiritual journey and some dreams are just dreams? How come, you know, when you have a fantasy or when you have like an epiphany, um, you know, it's just rushed aside. It's not rational. So it cannot be. Why do we limit ourselves to just rational? Is, is that the only way we can think? Are there other ways that do not actually anchor themselves on the whole idea of black and white, rational, good and wrong, and so on? Because in very many cultures, for example, black is actually an amalgamation of all the colors. It is precisely what makes us appreciate white. And in a sense, it's even more pure than than white but who would think that we've been so so uh trained to think that black is negative you get what i mean spirituality opens up a whole new way of understanding i will understand the the soul of an ant i will understand the sense of being of a blade of gra of grass i will understand that the ground um, that mother earth is crying as we rape her every day and nobody is coming up to stand up for her because I know in my spirituality, it is a being. It is an essence that requires respect and awe. You see what I mean? So we need to understand that religion per se is not a bad thing and you can be religious and spiritual. You just allow yourself a broadening 
of your mind and a better understanding of those gray areas that are not perfectly explained in this man-made kind of rule of books, you know, rule of behavior and codes that we have to adhere to. Well, I have another question for you. Something that has been bugging our minds since the moment we decided to bring in this uh, topic into the picture of interface dialogue series. For every one of us, our religious and cultural narratives are important to some more, to some less. And then knowing that for the other, the one with whom we come in contact, it is also important and sometimes even undivisible. Is this clash of these two, maybe sometimes different or opposing narratives inevitable? How do we learn to be together if what is so important to each one of us might be different? Do these narratives have to clash or how do we maybe prepare ourselves or allow ourselves to find a dialogue, yeah? The word that we are using a lot in this series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, um, the, I, the, the thing is, uh, we are so anchored on that Eurocentric dichotomy. If it's not agreeing with me, it's clashing with me. It's not true. It's not true. We can agree to disagree and still exist in perfect harmony. That's quite okay, you know? Um, and indeed, it's um, uh, having your faith in your religion does not at all negate your ability to have your faith in your spirituality. The two are not in competition with one another in any way. So in this sense, I think the important thing is to actually get back to our own humanity. I think in all religions, we acknowledge the, the, what do you call it? The sacredness of mankind. And we agree that it's not okay to dehumanize the other, you know? We agree that the other deserves at least to have the same possibilities, potentials, opportunities as I do. What they do with that, those opportunities, that is on them. But I'm not going to go out of my way to deny them of those opportunities of those possibilities and so on. Everyone is foraging in the forest of luck, in the forest of fate. We are all struggling, you know? But when we reach the common understanding of, hey, let us allow everyone the same, you know, equitable opportunity to achieve what they can achieve. If we can join forces towards achieving a common goal, that's all the better. But if we can't, it is not up to us to deny the other of their right and their the path that they are destined to follow. You see, so there's not, it's not a question of clash. We need to get away from the dichotomies. There are so many different kind of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Coordinates and, uh, and, you know, that we can add on to that, that really create that wealth that I called the tapestry that is society whether we are passive or active, negating, not negating, disapproving, rejecting, as long as we are here, we are part of the story. We are part of the story. And it's we are constantly creating that story. Think about it. It's like a phoenix. It rises from the ashes, you know? So in other cultures, once it's dead, once it's ash, it's finished finished, it's ash, gone, gone, gone. But no, you rise like a phoenix from the ashes. They may be something that I should tell. Uh, you see in the background, there are some amazing paintings there. You might wonder who is the author. That's our speaker today. So a very multi-talented person. Again, uh, if I may just add on to that. I, I took up speaking. I mean, I took up uh, painting as a way of healing. Because again, that's again one one spirituality. My son died in 2017 and I could not heal. And somebody told me you can do it through painting. So all my paintings are me mourning. All my emotions, they just flow into my canvas. And I have not sold a single painting because each of them is an aspect of the journey that I'm taking in my mourning. 
the journey can be in poem, in poem, it can be in dance, it can be in theater, it can be in so many ways. But once we understand that our options for grieving are really broad and are really spiritual and natural, and that they resonate with who we are, it 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 opens up a way to actually uh, don't not don't normalize it because you don't run away from your pain. You actually embrace your pain, be one with your pain, and make it make it a beautiful part of your life, a commemorable, respectful, you know, part of your life. You remember the person who has left you, and they are part of who you are. It's not an imagination. They are right here. Also, in the same time, maybe to collect it and to address it together, Nyashama, uh, there is one uh, question from Vic uh, in the chat before we went on this small group work. What if somebody egocentric, Eurocentric, not reflective, uh, how could I help that person to start asking questions, dig deeper, look into yeah. the history? what would be the process and how to understand how to enrich it. So yes. I think we take some other questions too and yes. collect one pile. And maybe yeah. if you could address those all together. Yeah. It's um, our groups, you have the floor. And we discussed um, how, like for like, um, how spirituality and religion are not like mutually exclusive, that you can't be, like that often religions are, or we find that religions are often um, aimed to kind of um, reflect on spirituality, but I don't think everybody within organized religion is doing that, even though that might be like where it stems from originally. Um, and uh, we also discuss the names a lot, like how names can have different, uh, like, you know, impacts on us and how we shared our stories with our names. And uh, I think maybe Marina, do you want to, I think you were taking points, maybe you want to add something? I think you you summarized, we basically discussed these two, two topics. Yeah, thank you very much. Did you come back with some kind of a question maybe, or uh, something that you would like our speaker to address? Mm. Maybe there's this kind of um, the, these reflections on like whether you see spirituality as something that um, um, like creates organized religion, even though it might not encompass it as a whole or something like uh, whether like maybe you, you mentioned that earlier, but if you could just reflect a little bit deeper on that, Marina, you might have to say. Or something to add. Yes, it's it. It was like uh, we were we were like I I was very curious um like uh, if in in your under in your understanding Ian Chama uh, is the like uh, it it sounded like if it's a con contrapositioning like uh, the doctrinal religions versus spirituality and uh, I. I I, we were talking about this. If it's uh, like uh, how 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 these two things can exist next to each other, um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we can also maybe um, take the ideas from the last, the second group, <laughs> and the last group for today, and then uh, you address all of these questions and ideas in one goal, yes. Uh, the other group, I think there was Anastasia there and uh, Elizabeth. Okay, I'm here. Uh, nice to meet everyone and see everyone. <laughs> Thank you for giving me a speech. Uh, what about, should I tell about the tapestry something? I, I wanted to share the idea for the whole uh, group as one, the main core about this. I, I like this very much. Excellent. I can share it from, it's like from Ukraine. Yes. And it's connected to my story, uh, uh, but I will be short. It's, uh, we have a flower, sunflower, and there are seeds inside. And they bring very nice oil and they're, they're, they're yellowish petals. 
that's the point. Like everyone, everyone's eyes have this gaze, and it is black gaze. We yeah. and uh, some something about this genetics, something something about really deep understanding about our uh, nature. Mm -hmm. all, probably excellent. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else from the group who would like to say something? Because we're not such a big group. So if you want to add something or ask something, now is a very good moment. Thank Elizabeth. Yes, I um, it was a very um, enriching exchange with the Anastasia and um, Slobodan wrote in the chat. Um, a, we talked also about the different layers of identity and how it can be perceived, like uh, we about the, the picture of the kaleidoscope that was mentioned before, but also that way of tapestry. Um, and I think it broadens the perspective of how many different uh, characters we bring um, in, in the daily social exchange with others. So I think it was more, it was this topic and um, yeah how we feel it for ourselves in, in daily life. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So now um, it's back to you. Yes. Yeah, yes. Um, okay. Thank you so much for your reactions. And what I do know is that sometimes a topic can be so compact that you need time to actually digest it and come back with questions. So um, for the participants, please be aware that uh, I avail myself to answer these questions. So you can always send them to the organizers and I will try my best to respond to, to your questions. So it's okay if you can't have a question right now, but these are things, cause I've touched you on a subliminal level. I've touched you spiritually. I've touched a level where, um, it needs to have a moment, maybe in dreams, imagination, fantasy, wondering, speculating. Good. I will try and answer the first question and then kind of uh, go through the, the reflections that were made in the other, in room one and room two. A Eurocentric person. I think it's okay to be Eurocentric, but it's okay to also ask yourself, what is Eurocentricism? Where does it come from? You know, who decided what, when? Who decided that ratio is the only way we can look forward? Who decided that only one way can be ratio? Are there no other rationalities in this world? Who decided that other rationalities are irrational? You know, who decided to be the plumb line to decide that we are the ones who determine what ratio is? When you start to question that, and when you start to wonder, are there other rationalities? I think it's the beginning of you questioning, you know, the person who is Eurocentric, questioning, hey, what is the veracity? What is the validity of Eurocentrism? You know, I give an example. We send our children to school, right? And we compel them to forced, I mean, I mean, obligatory education until a certain age with the promise that when they graduate, they'll be able to navigate their world, right? This Eurocentric education, which by the way, has been sold all over the world, presumes a world that is Eurocentric as well, homog homogeneously Eurocentric. What happens is these students graduate and the world is not Eurocentric. The world is very multi-perspective, very multicultural, diverse, multi-layered, and the tools that they were promised were going to help them navigate do not work. So what have we done? That's child abuse. We promised our children something we are not delivering. So isn't it upon us to offer these children a multi-perspective curriculum where they can have tools to address a multi-perspective world. You see what I mean? So we need to ask ourselves, is Eurocentricism actually working for us? Is it, is it the only way 
are there other ways or are we just going to be blind? Are we choosing to be blind? That is a self-determined myopia and it's nobody else's fault. It's a choice that one can make. But if one is open to broaden their minds, then believe me, there are a lot of ratios and rationales and ways of imagining our world because our world is not a single story. Our world is a very complex world with multiple stories, each of these narratives informing us, enriching us, empowering us, and enabling us to navigate this broad world. So I would suggest for the person who asked this question, ask your, your friend, to actually try and ask themselves which stories are not being told here. That is learn, learn for yourself. What's not being told here? What's not being clear here? What's not being you know, articulated? What is being silenced, erased, negated, even denied from visibility? Ask your friend to unlearn what are the misconceptions that they're being told, you know? There are many misconceptions. I'm not blaming anyone for these misconceptions. They happen if we don't have enough tools to actually um, analyze and determine. And then we relearn based on what we have unlearned and what we have learned. We have a completely broader perspective and it will only enrich the Eurocentrism. Okay, spirituality and religion. Spirituality and religion are not necessarily in competition with one another. It's not like saying I'm an agnostic or, you know, I'm a non-believer or a believer. I'm an atheist or a non-atheist. Even atheists base themselves on religion because they are saying I am, you know, you're constantly basing yourself on something else. Spirituality has got its own reasoning, its own logic. You know, and that's why I say you can be perfectly religious and still be a firm believer of certain spiritualities. This is why somebody who is very, very religious can still go for, can still go for crystals, can still go for, you know, for Reiki, can still go for, you know, these are all spiritualities that we feel enrich a certain aspect that we feel we are lacking. They can go for yoga. They can go for all these are spiritualities and they have got, they are not in competition with our religiosity. They only enrich our understanding of ourselves and our identity and how we navigate our world. So things don't have to be black and white in competition with one another. They can perfectly coexist with one another, enriching each other and perfectly informing each other without being in any way competitive with one another. So no, I don't agree that they are mutually exclusive. I don't believe that they are inclusive, but they could be, you see, that's the beauty. Allow yourself to be broad and multi-perspective, not tied into two perspectives. It's either black or white, it's either yes or no, no. Take in the in-between, embrace the in-between. <clears throat> So um, spirituality creates a grand, um, the tapestry. Uh, there was a, the room, the second room that mentioned the tapestry. It was actually a very, very beautiful example, the sunflower. But I believe that, you know, when we start to see the connection to the sunflower, we open our eyes to see that there are so many other connections. I have a friend who has a greenhouse and she will always put music in her greenhouse. And sometimes she'll just go there and read to her plants and they thrive. They respond. They respond to that love. Look at what happens with, with also with pets. You know, I was once asked to, to house sit a house and they had a, an aquarium and cats. And I thought I was going to house sit cats. And once in a while I was going to feed the fish. But when I lay down, because the, the coffee table was actually the aquarium. So when I lay down next to the aquarium to watch TV, all the fish would come my way. I said, wow. So I went and I lay on the other side and they would all come my way. You know, 
So they feel you. They are happy. We are not alone. You're here with us. You know? It's the same thing with plants. They feel you. The plants that you are nurturing, you're talking to, you're, it will definitely thrive. You know? The house. Imagine a house that is so beautiful, but nobody is living in it. Why does it just start to disintegrate and die? It needs you. It needs a life. Even the inanimate needs you. It feeds off you. It lives through you because you are the ones giving it meaning and giving yourself meaning. It's constantly echoing between you and them. So yes, we are a tapestry. We are woven with one another. We create our identities, recreate our identities, imagine, reimagine our identities like a bricolage through our engagement with one another, our engagement with the inanimate, with the animate, with nature, with the world, with all the elements um, and signals we're getting from our economy, our politics. We cannot pretend to be immune to the far right rising or maybe the, the PVDA or whatever. We cannot pretend to be immune. We have an opinion, we may not say it, but it impacts upon us, you know? And like I say, I bring us back to a very traumatic period, the Corona period. I mean, look at how we were all globally glued to the television and globally hurting, hurting. And there's no part of the world you can go to where they did not experience the emotions that we are experiencing here in Belgium. So yes, we do form a tapestry. We are layered and interwoven with one another. And it is in that weave, passively or actively, that forms the tapestry, that rich tapestry that is our society. Yes, thank you very much. And just in this moment, one of our former um speakers actually medium has left a really nice uh, comment in the chat saying that she often feels when people say oh these old things are full of soul it must be because they have been existing with people taking care of them a lot longer than the shine shiny brand new ones uh, that are kind of soulless um yeah thank you very much um I think this has been a very magical ID talk, I have to say. Closing the season with, with you in this very cozy group has been very special. And I think it's a good moment that we uh, let Olaja share what she has as graphic notes. I can imagine that when the conversation is so abstract and so metaphorical is maybe as a graphic recorder, we didn't make your life easier today. <laughs> but uh, we are not looking for easy ways. So still would love to see what you have come up with, Olaja. Definitely. Even when it feels a bit abstract, uh, you can clearly see when the, there is an underlining uh, beyond or behind every message. I hope you can see my screen now yes, and I the can. first version of this summary. So, yeah, I've been myself flowing a lot as well and, and uh, yeah, grabbing all these uh, symbolisms and all these metaphors that Nian Chama has shared with us today. So, Super exciting. And yeah, the, the silver lining, I still feel that it's very strong and and yeah, one, let's say, with all these different examples and all these situations at the end that yes, we are interconnected, that we influence one another, that we cannot live be it with without or with other beings or inanimate so so random so very inspiring. And yeah, I was just moving all these drawings back and forth and trying to see. Is there a specific order in the message? But then everything is as well interconnected. So at the end, I understood that no matter where I put these uh, quotes and these ideas, that it's part of the whole of, of the same unit. So yeah. I hope this makes uh, you you did, sense. you did an incredible job. That's what it's supposed to be. We are so we are so fixated on a linear kind of uh, presentation, but then it needs to be a web. It needs to be kind of, you know, trailing around and circular and bringing us 
ahead and behind and into everything and you've managed to bring that so beautifully out in uh, no it's it's gorgeous it's gorgeous we really really need to get away from because it's 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 crippling us it's making us so tight and we need to open up and dance dance with the with the spirits with the air with the wind with the water dance with here with the past with the present with the future let's be let's let's open up and let's learn that we are not shackled to eurocentrism to religion but whether we seek other explanations it's only going to enrich who we are it will enrich us make us better people make us richer people wealthier people bolder people so yeah you've done it beautifully thank you so much olaja i i every time i think i cannot be surprised more you do manage to surprise further thank you so much nian shama if there is something like a message or some final words that you would like to say we are a little bit uh, over our time already but yeah. that's okay if you have something to say, please. And then I will pass the floor to Maria because she also has an exciting announcement to make at the end of today's talk. Excellent. Um, so, I mean, like I said, I live my life anchored upon the spirituality of I am uh, because we are the Ubuntu spirituality. You know, you cannot be anchored on this spirituality if you do not acknowledge Utu. Utu is personhood, the humanity. So you need to first of all acknowledge that element that binds us, Utu. Utu makes us Ubuntu. It makes us Ubuntu. So having said that, it's important to know that the message I gave, learn and learn and relearn, is perfectly applicable in today's world when we want to understand, you know, uh, racism exclusion um capitalism we want to we can learn really learn and unlearn and relearn you know if it's politics if it's law if it's even religion we can apply the same methodology to actually get a deeper understanding so please if there's any message i can give it to you is that be very critically reflective and engage in that constant process of learning and learning and relearning so that you can re you can enrich yourself so that you can know how much that you have influenced others with your personality and identity and how they have also influenced you with their personality and identity we are one we are one and we are also us you know we are one and we are all Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, with uh, this last words from our speaker of today, I would like to give it back to uh, Maria from uh, Salto Inclusion and Diversity Resource Center that is bringing you the ID Talks for closing the season, but in a way leaving a little window still open. And I want you to tell what I mean to our public. Thank you, Anna. In a way, we lied a bit to you in the beginning of the ID Talks when Anna said that this is the end of the series and we are closing. Uh, it's partially true because actually um, on 29th of May, we will be back with one extra um, talk, but not a regular talk. So it's also some a, a bit of a tryout. We haven't done it before, but it came up as idea actually um, during one of the talks I think it was Finn's talk uh, on a community and interfaith dialogue uh, when Finn was talking about how they're using um, this method of dialogue tables to uh, talk and address the topic of faith uh, between the different communities. And then there was this request from your side that maybe we should have something like that online, that we should have this interfaith dialogue cafe where you could just, or we could just gather and, and talk. And yeah, we went for it. <laughs> so it's a, it's a bit experim experimental, experim ex experiment, experim experimental. experimental. Experimental, okay. Yes, so it's gonna be a bit experimental. 
Uh, but yeah, we are really willing uh, to try it out together with you. You will get more information about that uh, via email. But um, at the moment, I really just want to uh, thank the Union Chama for this really amazing, very poetic talk. I think I can say, I think we had 40 talks, but this one is for me maybe the most poetic and also very philosophical. And you were right that I think we will really need time to, to process what, all the things that we have heard uh, today from you and to give them a, a space and place. Um, but I think what I'm taking away um, from your talk today is this embrace the in-between. I think it's such an important message in this uh, so polarized uh, yes. world yeah. today uh, that, that we are really drifting apart like on, on yeah, just two ex yeah, extremes. So I think, uh, yeah, I would, I would, yeah, just also like to close the, yeah, the whole series, though it's not, not kind of closing, closing, but let's, um, with that, and I also love that you said just dance, <laughs> dance with yourself and dance with your present and past and future. It's really beautiful. Um, and I'm really uh, grateful for this journey that we had, that we started in, in February, but it's really just the beginning uh, because I, I also mentioned, um, earlier that actually we at Salto Inclusion and Diversity Resource Center, we are just starting to work on a topic of interfaith dialogue. Uh, it's the beginning of two years process and um, we just, yeah, we just scratched the surface with, with the talks and there is so much that came out from all five talks, at least for, for me and um, for, for my resource center that we want to explore further um, to, yeah, using different uh, means and uh, yeah. So I'm really looking forward also seeing some of you further on, on, uh, on that journey. There will be some seminars coming up, uh, publication, um, study visits, so a, a lot is going to happen. Uh, so we just started talking about interfaith uh, dialogue. This is really actually just the beginning. Exciting, mashallah. So, yeah, indeed. So Nianjama, thank you for being part of, of uh, ID Talks. Thank you, my team, lovely team. And also thank you all uh, you know, for being with us uh, every second Wednesday since um, February. Thank you. Anna, I thank you. And Anna, I pass the floor back to you. Yes. Uh, well, we will see each other more and again. So follow our social media and uh, follow our email communication. Thank you very much for today and see you in May, maybe. Yeah. So once Excellent. again, goodbye. Thank you, thank you very yeah. much.